unsullied by us humans, sex is a very good part of human life. We live our lives in a great deal of hypocrisy, telling our children to do one thing while we do something else. The quest for control. We all would love it if our lives were a bit more controllable. Discussions within the Christian community about these questions will be primary for the survival of the Christian community. I actually didn't meet him until today, but I became familiar with many of Stephen Post's writings when I was doing my doctoral work a few years ago, um, which I did in the field of sociology. And one day I decided that it would be good uh, for a sociologist to take some philosophy courses. Um, and it was in that context that I, I, I was introduced to a number of things that um, he has written. So I'm delighted to um, be able to introduce him today. Stephen Post is the professor uh, is a professor at the Center for Biomedical Ethics at K in the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. He serves as senior research scholar also in the Beckett Institute at St. Hughes College, Oxford University. He received his PhD in 1983 uh, in moral philosophy and religious ethics from the University of Chicago. Dr. Post is a member of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Panel of Alzheimer's Disease International. He serves on the National Ethics Board for Alzheimer's Association. He has been recognized for distinguished service by association chapters and families throughout the United States. Uh, his uh, most recent book, uh, The Moral Challenge of Alzheimer's Disease, is in its second edition and is considered a classic in the field of dementia caregiving. So um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce him, and please welcome him here. Good evening. Uh, that was a nice introduction. The short uh, version is uh, that uh, he's the guy from Cleveland who doesn't want to stand between you and dinner. Uh, so I'm going to get right to it. If we can dim the lights uh, a bit, uh, who's the light dimmer? Okay. Uh, that's okay. Um, I'm not going to uh, present uh, a kind of simple-minded, uh, unopinionated uh, set of ideas uh, for you. I'm going to give you uh, really uh, what I think is the scoop with uh, aging and dementia. Uh, you're absolutely at liberty to, uh, to disagree, and hopefully we'll have some time uh, toward the end uh, to, uh, to unpack some, uh, some arguments. Yeah, we live in an aging society. Uh, 200 years ago, when people on average were living into their uh, late 30s, men outliving women, uh, the Decalogue commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, wasn't quite so hard to handle. Uh, now we live in a world where people on average are living into their late 70s. In Japan, women are living on average to the age of 88. We have this demographic transition from the classical triangle with the old, old people 85 and older at the apex and then the broad base filled out by the relatively young. We've moved with the panacea of medical progress toward a demographic rectangle with roughly proportionate numbers of old and young. What's that mean? Uh, you go to the bookstores and you look at the shelves on theology and philosophy and you'll find books about intergenerational justice, about justice between the young and the old, about what we do in a world where uh, resources once upon a time bequeathed to one's children will likely by, be eaten up by nursing homes. What does all this mean in our world? Uh, this is a remarkable time that we live in. 
Uh, how do we want to die in these times? Uh, Stanley Hauerwas uh, was eloquent, of course. Maybe we want to go out like George Burns. We want to live to be 100. We want to be uh, lucid of mind. He did comedy skits until just a few months before the end, and he went out suddenly. Uh, perhaps we want to uh, remind ourselves of an old poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes called The One Ha She, about a carriage drawn by a single horse perfectly engineered so it would last a hundred years without having to go to the mechanic needing no grease job whatsoever and then one day after its hundredth birthday it would disintegrate into dust. That's called the compression of morbidity, squeezing out morbidity and frailty from old age and so that we are bubbly and effervescent like the young lady in the zest soap commercials until the very end. We impose a kind of cult of youth I suppose on the elderly in a society where the classical teaching functions of the elderly have been set aside because we are such a traditionalist culture. When my daughter wants a little wisdom, she tends to go to the latest software, not to grandma. Now, uh, let's think about this. Uh, when Robert Butler, who was given the Pulitzer Prize 18 years ago for his classic book, why survive growing old in America, when he coined the term ageism, talking about how it is that in this traditionalist society we would have a tendency to throw the elderly in the wastebasket. He said ageism would be especially pointed as a problem in the world of dementia, because there it is that we most emphatically don't want to be there, but for the grace of God, Go I. When I use the word dementia, I mean a precipitous decline from a former mental state. Everybody by about age 70 has normal age-related forgetfulness, a little slowing of the wheels. Be honest, how many of you have forgotten where you parked your car? That's not dementia, okay? It's okay to forget uh, where you parked your car. It's not okay to forget that you have a car that's parked. That's the difference. Um, or as one of my senior neurology friends, Joseph Michael Foley, says, it's all right to forget uh, the name of the restaurant where you had lunch, but it's not okay to forget that you had lunch at a restaurant. He's an Irishman. Okay. Um, look, how do we want to go out? Um, we want to be lucid of mind. Anti-aging uh, researchers at my university are studying ways to interrupt the aging process. You know, five years ago, I was at... Uh, Dr. Alois Alzheimer's birth home in Markbreich, Germany, uh, <clears throat> which now is owned by Lilly Neuroscience and it's used as a conference center. I met the three finest anti-aging researchers in Europe. They told me at lunch that aging is disease, that we should be more like parrots. I said, why parrots? They said, because parrots get this beautiful blue and yellow and uh, pink plumage and they never get gray hair. And we should be more like parrots because getting gray hair is part of the disease of aging. And they said, we're studying sea turtles. I'm an old marine science major from uh, college days. There are sea turtles that live to be 250 years of age. The anti-aging researchers said the sea turtles never get osteoporosis of the shell. So that's what we should be like. And guess what? Guess what? If you go back to the beginnings of the biological revolution 400 years ago in the Renaissance in England and read Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, you will find there not only ideas about a future where we have shimmerers, where we mix species, but you'll even see there reference to the waters of paradise, that the ultimate endeavor of biological and medical science would be to create embodied immortality. It's right there, horrible idea. I suppose, but it's right there. And let me tell you that the National Institutes of Aging has done so much funding now in radical anti-aging research uh, that it's issued an R01, a grant program for people like ourselves to study the social and ethical and even theological implications of radical lifespan extension. Open up to your www.geron.com and there you'll see it. The idea that within 50, 60 years we'll be living on average to be 140 or 150 years of age and that we will have uh, licked the morbidity of aging. We will be relatively youthful and relatively intact. Researchers are studying Ashkenazi Jews who age very well and successfully without chronic illnesses. That's a generalization, of course. We're thinking, can we live uh, like Jean Calment, 
the woman who graced the cover of Time magazine three years ago. She had died at the age of 122. When she was in her 70s, she sold a very expensive villa in the suburbs of Paris to a man in his 50s. It was a steep price, but she said, look, just pay me till I die. <laughs> he died 15 years after the deal of stress-induced illnesses. Then his children had to start making payments, and it was the best real estate in de uh, deal in history, not for him, for her, right? When she was 111, her doctor told her, Jane, you got to stop smoking. <laughs> when, she was, when she was 122, she died. She was perfectly lucid of mind. She knew who she was. She hadn't suffered from a dementing illness that strips away the story of one's life, that uh, really takes away one's biography, if you will. She hadn't lost the temporal glue between past and present and future. She was not consigned more or less to the pure present. She went out pretty well. Epidemiologists hope that, in fact, we can lick Alzheimer's disease and go on and live uh, extremely long lives and have our wits about us. Down the hallway from me at Case Western, the researchers have quadrupled the lifespan of the nematode worm. And these worms, you know, I'm, I'm careful when I go to the men's room because I don't want them coming out of the, out of the faucets. They're, they're big, they're fast, they're energetic, they don't have a period of decrepitude, and they're living three or four times the lifespan of any other previous known nematode worm. By the way, lifespan is different from life expectancy. The lifespan of a species is the longest that any given member has been yet known to live to. So the human lifespan at this point is about 120, 122. Life expectancy is about 70, 78 in industrialized countries. Uh, so there it is. And they're doing this with genetic modification. Doesn't it raise significant Christian theological issues, though, doesn't it, about whether as scientists we should be trying to reinvent human nature uh, or just working at the edges trying to in fact, treat diseases, trying to be coherently therapeutic. Shouldn't we be more humble? Shouldn't we see human nature as relatively good as it is? Or should we think more radically? Hey, I mean, this is, these, are, these are serious questions for our times. I won't talk about telomeric research, which is one of the genetic bases of anti-aging work. Telomeres are sort of like the the, 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 the very end caps of a chromosome, sort of like you have a little plastic uh, tape at the end of your shoelace, right? Every time the cell divides, it loses a telomere, so it divides so many times, and then it's, sh it's, 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 it's shortened to the extent that it can no longer effectively divide, and it dies, and that's the basis of organic aging. Cellular aging and then organ aging follows. Well, we're working hard in research to try to turn this around. And what would we, if we ever break through with this technology, and I think we will in the next 10 years, what do we do with it? Um, by the way, it's not just telomeric uh, genetic uh, studies that are going on. You have huge societies in America of elderly people who are doing intense fasting because they think that that, in fact, uh, enhances uh, their chances of a successful uh, old age. Uh, they will not be as uh, subject to uh, oxidative uh, deterioration. Uh, this is big time. Everyone down in Florida, you know, who has the money is shooting growth hormone, even though there's absolutely no empirical evidence that that does anything whatsoever to forestall the effects of aging. So we ask ourselves, extended life, eternal life. We had a major conference at the University of Pennsylvania last year on the implications of this. A Jewish rabbi from a Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, Rabbi Gilman, you may know him, a very famous man, said, look, uh, I'm not a dualist. I don't believe that there's a non-physical, spiritual stuff that uh, goes on after death. I believe in the resurrection of the body. So he said, look, uh, embodiment is good. Uh, if you can uh, have us living to be 150 or 160 or 200 years of age, fine. Lachaim, lachaim, to life, he said. Uh, and then he even went back into the Hebrew Bible and uh, looked at the uh, alleged lifespans of various patriarchs and its impressive stuff. So what do we think about mortality and when should we die? And of course, Geron and other startup companies want to say, look, you uh, get into organ failure and we will have cloned body parts so you can pick them out of a freezer and we'll do a lot of transplantation and you'll live, just keep going on and going on and going on. Uh, of course, I guess at some point you begin to look like a patchwork quilt, but we won't ask that question. 
This is serious business. In the meanwhile, back at the ranch, here's an old man, the nurse, whispering in his ear, scientists have extended the life of the fruit fly. He doesn't look particularly happy about that. Uh, look, uh, you know, he's uh, uh, aware that uh, uh, he's somewhat marginalized in our uh, traditionless uh, culture. Uh, uh, he is, to some extent, uh, the victim of uh, quite a significant stigma against uh, aging. Uh, we all need to be youthful, right? Uh, uh, that's the idea. That's the little old lady from Pasadena, isn't it? What will we use these technologies for? Here's a fellow who's just uh, nine years old, right? Uh, he's got hutchinson gilford disease, an autosomal dominant uh, genetic illness that causes premature aging. He'll die when he's about 13, maybe 14 on average, uh, as an old, old man. If we get these technologies together, maybe we'll use them therapeutically for people in this kind of a category. And believe me, there are a lot of people interested in that. And of course, uh, uh, with regard to the relationship between uh, Alzheimer's and Down syndrome, we know that people with Down syndrome also age prematurely, that by about age 40, all of them have the plaques and tangles neurologically that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, but only about a third of them actually show symptoms of the disease in their 40s. By the time they hit 50, the symptoms of Alzheimer's are more or less ubiquitous. Well, maybe we'll use it in this population and again, push back this kind of premature aging. Maybe we'll do that, I don't know. But I'm raising questions for you to think seriously about as Christians. Of course, we're all interested in the state of our brains. We live in this aging society. Uh, cover of Time Magazine talking about researchers at Harvard working with cognitive enhancers to enhance particular regions or domains of cognition. Uh, I have a neighbor in Shaker Heights, Ohio, who's uh, 89 years old now. He's married, and uh, 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 he gets up in the morning, and uh, he takes uh, ginkgo biloba, he takes vitamin E, he takes uh, uh, estrogen, and he takes uh, Aricept uh, off-label, a cholinesterase inhibitor. All this to save his brain. I say, well, okay, but what about your sex life? He says, oh, I don't just care about my brain now. I just care about my brain. Yeah, well, that's it, okay. So we're worried about this. And you know, I'll tell you, um, it has a lot of implications, preventing good brains from going bad. Um, I will tell you that the, uh, the historian Arnold Toynbee wrote in 1943 that the most significant ethical and moral and theological problem at the end of the 20th century would not be death, but the death of the mind before the death of the body. The president of the uh, American Psychiatric Association gave a plenary address three years ago and he said we are outliving our brains. And think about this. Maybe it means that the aging society, this effort to kind of extend and extend life expectancy, that it's not the panacea that we, uh, that we think it is. By age 65, roughly three to four percent of people have probable Alzheimer's disease. That more or less doubles every five years epidemiologically. So by age 70, you're talking about maybe seven, eight percent. By age 75, maybe what? You know, maybe 14 percent. Maybe age 80, you're talking what? You know, uh, 25 percent conservatively. Many studies indicate that by age 85, roughly 40 to 50 percent of people have probable Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Imagine we all get ourselves now so we can live. Uh, our children will be living uh, to be 85 or 90, right? So will everybody get dementia? Will there be two kinds of people in America, people with dementia and people caring for people with dementia? And how will we respond to that? Now, uh, the patron Christian saint of Alzheimer's disease is none other than Jonathan Swift. I'll tell you why that is a little later. Um, but most of you, suffice it to say, have read Gulliver's Travels at some point in your life, and you know that that book, which he wrote in 1737, while the Anglican rector of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin uh, <clears throat> depicts uh, Gulliver traveling among an unusual people, the Lugadagians. Every once in a while, a Lugadagian is born with a, uh, a pink dot on its forehead. And that means the Lugadagian will live forever. It's called an immortal or a Strolldbrug in the language of Lugadagian. And live forever. It's Gulliver hears that, he's ecstatic. What I would do, I could exercise my creativity endlessly, right? But, uh, you know, here's the reality, and this is really Jonathan Swift's 
Christian way of putting down Francis Bacon and the waters of paradise, the idea of a fountain of youth. In their eighth decade of life, these immortals begin to lose the common appellation of things. They have word-finding difficulties. Ronald Reagan, eight years ago, was quoted in the New York uh, Times uh, for pulling a book off his uh, shelf, handing it to someone and saying, have a tree. Right? Confusion about names. Unable to uh, remember the names of even close friends. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, after several years, as Swift describes it, these immortals can no longer engage in conversation because they forget the word that was immediately said prior to the moment. Seven or eight years after that, they're living in a kind of second childishness. I recall out at Heather Hill in Chardon, Ohio, you know, spending some time in a special care unit for uh, Alzheimer's patients. You know, I looked at the uh, bio sketch on a fellow who was in advanced dementia. I knew he had two kids. Bio sketches are good. You get to know a little bit about who you're working with. I asked him about his children. He couldn't communicate at all, but he handed me a branch, a twig, and he smiled. He was quite benignly adjusted emotionally to this situation. I asked the nurse, okay, what's the story here? She said, well, when he was a little boy growing up on the Western Reserve, he loved his father. And his father gave him a chore every morning, which was to carry kindling into the fireplace. So he was living back in that part of his life. See. Um, now, for those like Peter Singer, who completely disregard the, the value and sanctity of the life, even of the most deeply forgetful. I'll tell you something. This old man, that afternoon, he saw another person in the uh, Alzheimer's unit who was crying, a woman, an elderly woman, curled up almost fetal-like on the couch. This man has not communicated with anybody for months. Guess what he did? Surprising, and I saw it with my eyes. He walked over to a small doll that was lying on the floor. He picked it up. He brought it over to this woman, tapped her on the shoulder, and she stopped crying, and then he continued walking around endlessly. The problem is that we live in a hypercognitive society. Descartes said, cogito sum, I think, therefore I am. We Christians, we don't believe that. We think that's garbledy gook. Someone offered Descartes a cup of tea. He said, I think not, and he disappeared. <laughs> you believe that? Don't believe it. Don't believe it. But I make the point that we are not subjected to the narrow philosophical definitions of personhood. You do not count morally under the protective umbrella of do no harm unless you can project rational plans into the future and implement them. That's what Peter Singer is teaching students at Harvard, at uh, Princeton. That's what many of our so-called preference utilitarians are teaching students at colleges around the country. Right? We're more than that. We have emotional and relational and aesthetic and spiritual and symbolic lives. Many empirical studies indicate that people, even in the advanced stage of dementia, will come back to associate with the same symbol in art therapy classes. We'll get back to that. Well, Swift then um, tells us about the immortals. And he points out, first major ethical principle, and of course, he was the great Christian ethicist about this issue. He said, the deeply forgetful are hated by all sorts of people. They're despised. Think about it. What's the great cult movie? Harrison Ford's Blade Runner, for example, where the replicants who are human-like have no protective status. They don't count ethically and morally in God's universe. Why? Because they have no memory. And it's just when one of them mistakenly has memory implanted that Harrison Ford becomes her protagonist. Of course, it also happens to be that she's a knockout. Okay, so how do you interpret that? I don't know. Uh, many people with Alzheimer's disease say that they feel rejected, stigmatized. They say that people don't talk with them. Um, they talk around them, they talk about them, but they don't respect them. Somehow you've got dementia, and because in our hypercognitive cultural scenario, that is the ultimate affront to our values, to our images of human fulfillment. We say that we want to keep as far away from that person as we possibly can. Absolutely contrary to the gospel image of Jesus who would embrace the deeply forgetful in a moment. The king of the Lugnagians says to Gulliver, take a few of these immortals home to your own people 
and tell them not to fear death. We'll talk a little bit about dying with dementia. I'm not going to go into the science of Alzheimer's. I will tell you that um, there's 4 million people in America these days with Alzheimer's disease. Um, we're spending $100 billion a year if you include indirect costs, that is to say the cost that might uh, um, come to a woman who as a caregiver quitting a job would lose income. It happens to be the case that about 70% of Alzheimer's direct caregivers are women, about 30% are men. Um, the uh, science doesn't look too impressive right now. We're still debating uh, even the most fundamental scientific questions. What causes Alzheimer's disease? Is it beta amyloid, Dow? Is it uh, misplaced cell division so that Alzheimer's is really a subtle form of cancer brought on by inflammation of the brain? We just don't know. We're no place with this. And, uh, and it's tough. It's, an, it's a very complicated disease. Uh, the Germans had a response to it in uh, 1939. They started a program called Tiergestrasse 4 or 4th Street in Munich run by two psychiatrists. They took 70,000 individuals out of nursing homes and mental institutions, about half of whom it's been estimated now uh, by the Alzheimer uh, 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 Institute in Markbrecht, about half of whom had probable Alzheimer disease. And guess what they did? They put them out in the hypothermia vats at night to freeze to death. And they did freeze to death. Uh, they infected them with uh, deadly agents. Uh, after a year and a half, the German people insisted that the T4 program, as it was called, be stopped. Uh, now note, these people, these deeply forgetful folks, were not being discriminated against racially. They were not uh, discriminated against because they were gypsies or people of color or Jews or whatever. They were being discriminated against because they were deeply forgetful. And because they were more forgetful than most of us, they were deemed to be life unworthy of life. Uh, most of the technologies from the T4 program were directly transferred to Dachau and Auschwitz. The Nazi medical atrocities of the Holocaust did not begin at those death camps. They began in the context of Tiergestrasse 4. Do we want to go that route? We could go that route. I think there are some people who actually think we ought to do that. Um, just proceeding now following the chronology of the disease. I've talked a bit about stigma. I've talked about this uh, possibility for abuse and violence uh, against the forgetful because they're forgetful. Um, it's a picture of uh, Ronnie and Nancy Reagan. Um, by the way, Nancy Reagan is pushing hard for uh, stem cell research on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, quick comment, um, people pushed hard for fetal tissue transplant research on Alzheimer's disease. It was of absolutely no validity whatsoever. It was never even applied to that context. We're overhyping the usefulness of the stem cell research. If you look at the Parkinson's study that was completed just uh, some months ago, showed up on the cover of the New York Times. You know, they drilled these little holes in people's brains, needle-sized holes, injected the stem cells. The stem cells didn't differentiate in the Parkinson's brain to form neurons and create L-DOPA. Instead, they just undifferentiated, multiplied, much worsened the conditions of the six subjects. The research had to be stopped immediately, and those subjects, of course, have had a precipitous decline that they otherwise would have avoided. So let's not fool ourselves about the science here. And I think myself that the best solutions to Alzheimer's disease will come with the beta amyloid vaccine that Elan Pharmaceuticals is developing. We're going to supersede any of this stem cell garbledygook probably in about six months. Just put that in perspective. But anyway, um, a very, very good thing, a very, very good thing. Um, 1994, Ronald Reagan wrote the most theological letter that a president has ever written to the American people. I happened to be in Kansas City working with the Kansas City Alzheimer's chapters in nursing homes for that week. And uh, so I picked this up from the uh, Kansas City uh, uh, Star. Uh, he's sharing his diagnosis of the disease. He's saying, look, I've got Alzheimer's and uh, I'm not afraid to say it. There's something about naming the disease in public, being able to speak about it as a loving community of faithful individuals that destigmatizes it that allows us to embrace rather than exclude. You have to name the silences. And uh, he did that. And whatever your politics are, left, right, I don't care. You know, It's a very poignant letter and a very powerful letter. He talks about Nancy uh, 
what it means for her. He says, when the Lord calls me home, whenever that may be, I will leave with the greatest love for this country of ours and eternal optimism for its future. I now begin that journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. May God always bless you. Very powerful, very, very theological, very, uh, important letter. The Alzheimer's Association says, yeah, diagnostically, you ought to tell people that they have a probable diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease so they can perhaps uh, you know, quit work early and if they want to spend some of their good remaining quality years, uh, they can be trout fishing in Montana. Um, they can make economic plans so that perhaps they can and, uh, get some money off to the uh, next generation. Uh, they can come to support groups. I go to support groups on Wednesday nights for people with Alzheimer's. And you know, it's a tribute to the human spirit. One recent study that we published in the gerontology has indicated that 92% of people in America principally cope with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease through spiritual and religious ideation and practice. They rely on their spirituality. They are out of control. They are seeing their temporal glue slide. They are insightful into this peeling away of their capacities. They do not have control. The lie of being humanly in control of our fates is absolutely vivid to them. So they look toward whatever it is in the universe that they think is in control, and that uh, entity is a being higher than ourselves. Uh, they're amazing sessions, very, very powerful, very spiritual, uh, and oftentimes filled with humor which is quite remarkable in itself. I could talk about that, but I won't. Also, the Alzheimer's Association says it's important that people, while they still have their wits about them, for example, file a durable power of attorney for health care, and so that in the advanced stage of the disease, um, they don't need to wind up with a tube in every orifice, natural and unnatural. Remember the statement from Gulliver's Travels. The king says to Gulliver, bring a few immortals home to your own people so that they don't fear death. Um, this is a brochure from the Portland, Oregon chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. I was actually out consulting with them when they put this together. I think they're for it and it dribbles off. It's like for you people who work in this world of uh, nursing homes, it's like a failed mini mental test, right? The fellow has insight into this. I like to say, and I write this in my book, um, if there's a kind point, although I hate to use the word kind, if there's a kind point in the progression of this disease, which many of us will die of in this room, possibly a third of us, right? Possibly half of our children. Uh, if there's a kind point, it's when people forget that they forget because then they lose insight into this peeling away and they can have whatever emotional adjustment they get at that point. I think pastoral care has neglected Alzheimer's disease. I'm currently working with a major national initiative on pastoral care and dementia through the Alzheimer's Association. I'm sure many of you in your churches, you know, you, uh, you have programs for the deeply forgetful, right? You have respite programs, you reach out to these people and to their families. By the way, guess what? The highest percentage of, sui of uh, depression in the United States of America exists in the subpopulation of caregivers for persons with dementia. Read the 36-hour day and you'll see what it's like. It's midnight, you've been dealing with uh, incontinence of bowel and bladder, with behavioral disorders, with wandering, uh, uh, with very challenging situations. You just get the light off at midnight, and guess what, in comes mom or dad with disrupted sleep-wake cycles, and it's a new day, right? 36-hour day is a powerful book in this field. So obviously stress, uh, accumulates. There are many p caregivers who will not outlive the persons with the disease, as the Journal of the American Medical Association reported just three months ago, because they give way to stress-induced illnesses. Um, we need to do more spiritual care. It is unconscionable that our religious communities have done too little for the deeply forgetful. Absolutely unconscionable. Uh, I know ministers in my neck of the woods who are good about this situation. I know many who just don't want to deal with it, don't want to see it, don't want to hear about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, a member of the congregation gets old, isn't coming, you hear the rumor, person has dementia, and that's it. They're written off the face of the earth. So we need to mobilize our communities of faith. We need to be, as Christians, a kind of prosthesis for the deeply forgetful. We need to remind them of their life journey. We need to fill in the gaps as they lose their temporal glue. We need to become their voice. We need to speak with them even when they cannot speak back to us. That's Christianity. 
Caregivers ask, will I be next? There's no good genetic test for this uh, disease, and I'm not going to go into the genetics. Uh, one of my own pieces from the Journal of the American Medical Association pretty much established the inadequacy of any existing tests. Um, <clears throat> the, um, all the drugs around, uh, many of which are just unproven and uh, 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 existing uh, on, uh, on myth alone. Uh, I think there is some, some uh, possibility that we'll be able to identify people at high risk and use preventive interventions maybe within the next decade. but. Uh, those interventions will not uh, do much more than delay onset of disease. Um, issues in death and dying. The Alzheimer's Association in its uh, formal statement says, look, uh, in the advanced stage of this disease, when a person has generally lost the uh, continents of bowel and or bladder, is no longer ambulatory, uh, is subject to severe infections, uh, which are more or less intractable, is losing weight intractably, whether you use a feeding tube or assisted oral feeding, uh, can no longer communicate by speech. Uh, at that point, uh, 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 you really have a terminal condition, and uh, there ought to be no, uh, no effort uh, made to use uh, technological uh, interventions, which are highly invasive or even minimally invasive. And so therefore, the association takes the point that feeding pegs ought not to be used in this population. Well, I'll talk about that, because I know it's controversial. When I was in um, college, I worked nights as a dialysis technician, three 13-hour shifts a night. And uh, that was in the mid-'70s. We had a lot of elderly people. We didn't use the word Alzheimer's. It wasn't around at the time, really. But we knew what dementia was in the elderly. So we had these folks come in for dialysis. And I, as a dialysis tech, I had to take a little Novocaine needle, put it above the bovine graft, right, soften it up, then go in with a butterfly needle. Let me tell you, by the time these people with uh, dementia had gone through that, they had no insight into what I was doing, right? So what, what to me had benign intentionality, I was trying to help them, they viewed as something like an assault or something on the range between assault and torture. And we had to tie them down in these big black chairs, arm and leg, and they would be flailing. We'd sedate them, but the sedation would run out through the uh, dialysis system. It was pure hell. And it was only in 1984 that the Institute of Medicine said that you really shouldn't dialyze people with uh, moderate and advanced dementia because uh, it really um, uh, violates the principle of do no harm. It is just not acceptable to put them through this kind of a pure living hell for any purpose whatsoever. Now, that's interesting. Um, the association, by the way, firmly recommends hospice. And you should know that, you know, uh, you don't hear this when you read your nursing textbooks, but Cicely Saunders, uh, who began hospice in the modern world uh, at St. Christopher's in London, by the way, she took the ancient medieval word hospice, which just meant a place to spend the night, right? Uh, usually uh, uh, for wayfarers, uh, oftentimes connected with a monastery. She said, well, death is kind of like a journey. Uh, why don't we call hospice in the modern sense of death and dying, uh, why don't we call that hospice, right? Because that's a journey too. Well, um, um, she was, she's a deep Christian woman uh, of the Anglican sort who really prayed and prayed about this. And to hear her testimonies about how God asked her to create hospice is really quite remarkable. So the association really recommends hospice as the most dignified way to deal with people in advanced dementia. Um, this is an Alzheimer's Calgary Bill of Rights. Uh, uh, for people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I won't go into that, but notice the tree in the background, the implication being that people can be very demented, but they can still enjoy a leaf. Uh, uh, they can still enjoy uh, the colors of fall. Uh, they can still enjoy the world around them and God's creation. And maybe, in fact, more so than many of us, because we're too busy to take stock of the loveliness of the world that we live in. Um, Tom Kitwood, uh, a Wesleyan uh, minister from uh, England from the Bradford Dementia Institute, wrote this classic book several years ago where he talked about the uh, Christian vocation of dementia care mapping where you would work uh, to enhance the emotional and relational interaction between caregivers and the deeply forgetful so that adverse emotional uh, moments could be avoided. Uh, Kitwood, now deceased, was a great man and a close friend. Big issue that comes up for everyone, uh, nursing home placement. Are you sure this ice flow is going to pass by the nursing home? From the New Yorker, of course. Well, look, you know, bottom line is, you know, cultures have practiced senicide. 
uh, the Eskimos practice senicide, right? Uh, when someone uh, loses their cognitive capacities, it's, uh, it's out on the ice in adios. Uh, my wife Mitsuko is from uh, Ishikoshi Chomiyagi Ken, Japan. That's the northern part of Japan, and I've spent time up there and interviewed uh, families of people with Alzheimer's disease because they have the highest incidence of Alzheimer's disease in the world since they're all living into their mid and late 80s, right? Uh, I mean, half of people in Japan are dying of Alzheimer's disease. You don't think this is an epidemic? Um, so um, this is a, this is a pan-Confucianist culture. This is a world where, where Chinese Confucianism is writ large. The highest moral and spiritual principle is filial piety, a kind of worship of the parent. You know, I, I was talking to a, to a Korean fellow at Princeton Theological Seminary. He said the most revolutionary thing about Judea, Judaism and Christianity is in, in Genesis where it says that in fact the uh, conjugal unit uh, has a priority over the parental obligations, right? Uh, that's, ra that's radical, that's radical. So filial duties are everything. Well, let me tell you, just, just put this in perspective. Um, and this is documented in a video movie which you can get uh, through the right uh, websites called The Promise. Um, in rural Japan, um, the oldest son will take the demented mother or father in the advanced stage. At midnight on the evening of the month when the moon is full, that has Zen Buddhist significance, take them to the middle of the tatami mat and bury their head in a bowl of water until death. Now understand that this is occurring in a culture where filial obligations are even more critical than they are in the Judeo-Christian world. It's an example of where we could go. The government kind of looks away from this, but it's well documented and I studied it myself. Um, well, okay, people, this, I'm being a little bit rangy here, but back to the slides. Uh, people extract a promise from their caregivers. Don't ever put me in a nursing home. Well, let me tell you that that's a promise made to be broken. There are two million people in nursing homes in America, about 950,000 of them have Alzheimer's disease. Pretty much everybody in the advanced stages winds up in assisted living or a nursing home. We shouldn't feel badly about that. I think family caregivers should visit in the institutional settings, but the bottom line is that for most caregivers, not all, not, not all, but for most, 90 percent, 95 percent, it just becomes too difficult. It's so hard to handle this. And of course, the stress on the caregivers count too. So you have to think about this in terms of the well-being of all the family members as well. Um, and this is a kind of a tip sheet about how to facilitate respectfully uh, the placement in a nursing home. I won't go into that. This is an interesting Christian woman I met in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. She heads a movement, the Alzheimer's Clown Movement, which is deeply theological. And she takes volunteers, purely altruistically, into nursing homes around uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Dakota. They go into the nursing homes and they'll walk into a room where you've got you know, 15 people with their heads down, uh, slurping on their chest, incommunicado, uh, and uh, she has a way of coming to them with uh, spirit, with affect, she smiles gracefully, she has a kind of palpable, agopic affirmation that's deeply powerful, right? Uh, and uh, she brings to them as best she can in our limited ways the love of God. Uh, and, uh, and she'll sing hymns with them from their generational cohort. A lot of times people do in fact symbolically associate with religious symbols and, and, and hymns because they are deeply meaningful as they're growing up and they retain this material uh, quite well even into the advanced stage of the disease. She brings a little puppy dog because we know from studies that these people respond very well to, uh, to Labradors in particular, but other kinds of dogs. In fact, around nursing homes in the country, there's the Eden alternative. You go into some of these, you know that. Yeah, you go into some of these units, and you see trees and parrots and dogs and kittens. You know, it's amazing. Hey, uh, be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion over the things of the earth. Why can't we uh, recognize that these individuals, they may be deeply forgetful, they could have a better proximity to the meaning of God's beauty and creation than we do. Who knows? De Kooning, America's great abstract expressionist uh, um, 
diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease about um, 1985, died in 1999, was all over the media, greatest artist in America in this century, most would say. Uh, he spent 14 years painting with Alzheimer's disease. And there was an exhibit of his work posthumously at the Museum of Modern Art. All the critics, the, 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 the silly critics, they said, oh, he was a shell of his former self, a husk. He's not there. He's gone. He's absent, right? All they saw was the glass half empty. But uh, the reviewer I like said, wait a minute. This is a man who knew what he loved to do. He expressed himself artistically until darn near the end. See, he was still there in a way. And by the way, they had a hard time getting it out, him out of his painter's dungarees because he symbolically associated his whole journey of life with being an artist. So sometimes they had to sedate him, okay, to get those things off him. But that tells you something about the symbolic self, right? Uh, it tells you something very deep, uh, uh, you know, that somehow there's, you can't ever just say, well, the person's not there. You can't say that. That's what the secular utilitarian philosophers are arguing. You can't do that. It doesn't work. It's not true to my experience. You know, I was sitting with uh, a, a very famous neurologist uh, not long ago in a nursing home with a guy that he'd been at the Normandy invasion with. And the, my neurologist friend was talking with this old friend. He was not getting any response. And um, uh, as he was leaving the room, the old friend, bedridden, said, that was really something. Thanks. And that was it. So it's a, you can be surprised. I don't want to be silly. I don't want to be unrealistic. But what I'm saying is that um, sometimes there's more there than meets the eye. Um, now, a question is, should the intact self that still have its, has its wits about it uh, have some authority over the fate, uh, its fate as it declines uh, and enters into the advanced stage of the disease? I just want you to know something that, um, you know, first of all, I'm, a, I'm an opponent of preemptive assisted suicide. I'm a, an opponent of euthanasia. Uh, but uh, let's recognize that treatment refusal and treatment withdrawal are pretty much par for the course and are not ethically and legally so controversial. Um, some of you might think that um, in the advanced stage of this disease, when people lose their capacity to swallow, that you should go with a uh, feeding peg. Well, this study from the Journal of the American Medical Association said, number one, that the feeding peg does not lengthen life. That in fact, these people are more subject to aspiration pneumonia infections through a feeding peg than they are through assisted oral feeding. Number two, they're more subject to deadly infections, decubitized skin ulcers, because they get massively increased diarrhea on, a, on, on the feeding peg, which is not hard to, hard to, it's not easy to take care of to begin with, right? We're in a movement now internationally to untie the deeply forgetful. Untie them from these jerry chairs. Let them be alive and free. Well, in fact, the major reason why people still tie these folks down is because they see that little two-inch tube sticking out of their gut, and they don't have any insight into it, so they start yanking on it. And then they get confined, and that's not good. Um, I could go on and on. If you think as a Christian, you think about the beauty of love, of I-thou relationships. Well, one of the few things that these people with advanced dementia have going for them is an ability to have palatial pleasure. And there's a lot of emotional, relational, aesthetic interaction, spiritual interaction that goes on in the process of assisted oral feeding. I know because I've been doing it for 13 years as a volunteer. You don't do them any good. You remove a whole number of benefits associated with, assist, with uh, assisted oral feeding. What's the worst thing in the world is when a doctor says to anybody, hey, you don't want to use a feeding peg on your mom, you're killing her. Far from it. The Christian alternative is assisted oral feeding. I was a boy up in a prep school in New Hampshire called St. Paul's in the early 70s, Episcopal outfit. And the symbol of the school was the pelican. And the pelican was the symbol of Christian love in the medieval period. Why? You know. Because it would, if it had to, uh, pluck its chest vein to provide blood nutriment for its offspring. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. The real give and take, taking the time to provide this kind of sustenance, to be relational with these people who still count in God's 
world, in my opinion. So uh, we take that away from them when we uh, insist on a technological approach that is actually quite harmful. Um, I will just show you one chart. The dash line, people who are on uh, feeding tubes, the po polka dot line, the dotted line, people who are on assisted oral feeding statistically, you just don't get any benefit in terms of longevity if that's your therapeutic goal in the advanced stage if you go with the PEG. There's just no benefit. That is a myth. So how did people die before 1985? Nobody with Alzheimer's disease in the whole world had ever been given a tube because tube surgery was too complicated. Actually, it was 1981 at uh, Case Western Reserve's uh, University Hospital, uh, Children's Hospital. Uh, um, uh, this is Rainbow Hospital. Some of you from Ohio may know that. That's where the feeding peg was uh, invented by a gut surgeon named Michael Gatteret. Uh, for children, for people with stroke who could recover their ability to eat at some point, perhaps, uh, that could be used reasonably for people, uh, but not, he, uh, he never said that he wanted it used for people who were terminally ill with advanced stage dementia. Um, and in fact, uh, Gatterer himself uh, wrote an article to that effect recently. It was only in about 1985 that the PEG was introduced in nursing homes, not for humane reasons, not for good reasons or Christian reasons, but why? Because our Medicare system is, pardon me, ass backwards. We reimburse higher for skilled nursing care than we do for routine nursing care, right? So nursing homes get more money from the government if they use a PEG than they do if they handle assisted oral feeding plausibly, which they should be doing. In Canada, the incentive financially is reversed, so nobody uses a feeding PEG up in Canada. This is all money. It's also the case that there are gut surgeons, I'm sorry to say, and I know some of them, who realize that PEG tube feeding for people with advanced dementia is not a good idea, but they don't want to interrupt the revenue stream that comes from the referrals from the nursing homes into the hospitals where they do the surgery. Okay. So what did we do? Well, we, we did what people did for centuries. Juicy gelatin, milky gelatin, applesauce, prune, bran. Um, my, uh, my grandmother probably died of what must have been Alzheimer's disease, and that's how we handled her, and she was perfectly comfortable until the end. She was a writer. And it was hard to see her lose that ability, but uh, she still had her she still had her graces, her etiquette to the end. Older person's opinions about life-sustaining procedures in the face of dementia. We live in a fragmented culture. In this particular study, 95 plus percent of respondents said, if I get into the advanced stage of the dementia, keep me comfortable, but do not purposely try to extend my life. You know, 95 plus percent is a statistician's way of saying there's a clear consensus, right? So it's not only that we're not helping people with the PEG, but we're doing something against their stewardship will. Antibiotics, I won't go into except to say that they don't do any good in the advanced stage of the disease unless they're used purely palliatively for usually uh, bladder infections. But for chest infections, they have no impact. Now, I'm sorry to give you this cartoon, but here you have it. Since you've got no right to health care, but a right to physician-assisted suicide, take two aspirin and I'll kill you in the morning. And we heard Stanley Hauerwas rightly talk about uh, the evil of Kevorkian. Dr. Kevorkian asked that he be sentenced to community service, like at a nursing home or something. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when I was a uh, sort of punk kid, I, uh, age of 16, I hitchhiked across the United States on Route 80 and went to Reed College in Portland, Oregon. I was not very theological at the time. <clears throat> I know Portland well. Janet Atkins was... Uh, Kevorkian's first uh, subject in 1988. She was a school teacher in the public school system in Portland. She was a good amateur pianist who loved Chopin in particular. Two years into the diagnosis, she had an early diagnosis. She went up to Seattle, Washington to get on a Tacrin study, an anti-dementia compound that was pretty useless. She realized that. She gets to a point where she can no longer read a newspaper article comprehensively or remember her favorite Chopin sonata, so she meets with her husband and her three adult independent sons. They facilitate her trip to Flint, Michigan, and she goes behind the Kmart and she steps onto the parking lot into the gray, rusting VW microbus, and there is Kevorkian with his Mercitron machine, language being everything. Uh, 
and uh, he puts the butterfly needle in her arm. She pushes the final red button that allows the poison from the third sac to flow into her veins and take her from the face of the earth. <clears throat> What's interesting about um, Janet Atkins is that she wasn't gung-ho about assisted suicide. If you actually read the interviews between herself and Murray Ruskind, her geriatric psychiatrist, she didn't trust the healthcare system to respect her stewardship in the advanced stage of the disease. In the late 1980s, people with Alzheimer's disease were getting cut and nailed and needled to death in the advanced stage. And it wasn't, of course, even extending their lives. But that was what we were doing, because we weren't very sophisticated. So she did not want to be victimized in that way. I was on a panel with uh, Senator Jay Rockefeller uh, in uh, Washington, DC, a couple years ago for the Alzheimer's Association annual public policy forum. And he spoke about his mother who died of Alzheimer's disease. And she's, you know, she kind of said, look, uh, when she was competent, she said, just you know, let me have a natural God-given death um, at the end of this. She was in a nursing home. Somehow she wound up with the tube in every orifice, natural and unnatural, with the needles in her arm, the peg in her gut. She hadn't spoken to anybody for four months. Jay Rockefeller walked into that nursing home one afternoon, and a miracle happened. Because there are miracles, you know, there, there are miracles. His mother opened her eyes. And she looked at him crying, and she said these three words twice. She said, Jay, help me. Jay, help me. And that uh, evening, they took her out of the nursing home. They had the peg removed. They, turns out she could be perfectly fine with apple, pr apple <laughs> prune, gelatin, whatever, you know. And she was at home, and they prayed with her, and they sang hymns around her, and she died comfortably two or three months later. Um, final point. Um, I told you about Jonathan Swift at the beginning of this little talk. Uh, three summers ago, I, I gave the Jonathan Swift lectures at St. Patrick's Hospital in Dublin. Swift had been on the uh, board of trustees of the first mental institution in um, mental hospital in, uh, in the UK. Um, and that was called uh, Bethlehem, from which the word Bedlam comes. We're talking 1710, 1715. Um, at that time, they believed that the best way to help people with dementia and mental illness was to beat them physically. This was based on a Newtonian view of mental illness. So folks would come in for a farthing, uh, people from the street, they'd pay money, they'd come into Bethlehem and they'd throw rocks and tomatoes and sticks at the deeply forgetful, and this was supposed to be beneficial and humane. Well, um, Swiftby was appalled by this. So eight, uh, he quit the board of Bethlehem, and eight years before he died, in Dublin, he bequeathed 10,000 pounds, which was the money that he'd earned his royalties from uh, all his writings, to start a hospital, the first hospital in the Western world, a Christian hospital for people who were deeply forgetful. It's called St. Patrick's. It exists to this day. Um, <clears throat> he quoted the Sermon on the Mount in his statement of bequeathment. He said, no one shall assault the deeply forgetful. He said, you want to have people in St. Patrick's from the vicinity of Dublin so their family members can come and visit them weekly and even pray with them. Because he was an Anglican rector, and he believed in that. And he said that it should be built in the vicinity of a medical hospital, while St. Stephen's, which is now the uh, Museum of Dublin, is just about 100 yards down the road from St. Patrick's. And in every county throughout uh, Ireland, you've got satellites of St. Patrick's. And they treat people with prayer and with love. In the advanced stage, they take an hospice approach. And it is really a legacy to um, Jonathan Swift. Six years before he died, he was dying. Well, he basically had what most historians say in the literature was Alzheimer's disease diagnosed. And he lived in a corner of St. Patrick's Cathedral. Let me just show you St. Patrick's, which you can see from Main Street in Dublin. He lived in a corner with a housekeeper who took care of him as best she could. He never had the benefits of St. Patrick's. Um, but um, he devoted his adult life as a Christian theologian to the care of people with mental illness and dementia. He took them into Trinity Church. He started St. Patrick's. Um, one of the great moments of my life, you know, I, I took the uh, Irish ferry back from Dublin to Hollyhead, Wales, and then down to, I took the train down to Oxford. And, um, Believe it or not, the, the boat I got on was called the Jonathan Swift. And, and uh, I, was, I just thought, unbelievable, you know? And it had a big cabin about the size of this room, right? And there were murals on every wall of Swift and St. Patrick's. 
and how we had this particular Christian sense of the limits of the Enlightenment notion, cogito sum, I think, therefore I am. He believed with all his heart that we are more than our thoughts, that we are emotional and relational and spiritual and aesthetic and symbolic creatures, the children of God in all these dimensions. And he lived his life on that principle. Um, and he was a great man. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I see that it's I see that it's six o'clock, but maybe we have time for one or two questions, and then there are uh, some announcements that have to be made before you leave. Maybe just one, and maybe maybe two if it's short. Okay. Anyone want to ask a question? Maybe not. Yeah, please, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to ask if there's anything you could recommend to help churches in not being judgmental about families who have to place a loved one in a nursing home. Right. There seems to be a stigma attached to it, and I've encountered it more than once. Yeah. Well, first of all, churches should be mobilized to provide respite support for these caregivers so they don't burn out, get depressed in 36-hour days. We're not doing enough of that. Now, some congregations are doing a good job, uh, uh, but, but there's not enough sophistication in this area. So we need to, to first of all, support the caregivers so that they don't have to rely prematurely on nursing home placement. When you do have nursing home placement, it simply has to be understood that uh, you know, at some point, um, uh, caregivers uh, 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 are God's children too. And we can't expect uh, that um, uh, they should be uh, uh, placed on the altar of self-immolation. I mean, they have to go on in their lives and, and, and uh, and so it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to move eventually uh, toward uh, 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 an assisted living environment or some other similar environment, uh, just because this stuff is too much to handle. I mean, anybody, who, who's cared for somebody with Alzheimer's around here? How, hands up. A lot of you, right? You know what I'm talking about. This is a big deal, you know? Now, you know, sometimes, you know, the families, families manage it, uh, but they're unusual families. Okay, one more question, then we'll, then we'll have announcements. Okay. I want to make a statement. Uh, uh, my mother had Alzheimer's supposedly 15 years. I don't know. We took very good care of her at home, and then finally we had to put her in a nursing home for seven years. But I would fly out to Arizona and see her every three months, and I would stay there for a day, and I would sing to her, uh -huh. and I'd put my hand on her throat, and she would sing, I'd rather have Jesus. Uh, what a friend we have, the old rugged cross. And I could feel it in her throat. And so although she appeared for the last three years not to be responsive except ah and oil feeding, she really was there somewhere yeah. deep inside. Yeah, and the spirit of the Lord was in her and she was in the Lord. Thanks.